Hello, on behalf of the Center for Elder Law and Justice, this is Melissa Woods, Project Coordinator for the Senior Financial Safety Tool. And today we're gonna to be conducting a training about finance exploitation, the Senior Financial Safety Tool, and what to look for if somebody may be the victim of financial exploitation. The Senior Financial Safety Tool project is supported through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Justice Programs Office for Victims of Crime Award number 2018 B3GX K024. The opinions, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this project are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the U.S. Department of Justice. My name is Erin Riker, also from the Center for Elder Law and Justice. I am the technology-based legal services attorney here, and I will also be assisting on this training. What is financial exploitation? We will be using the abbreviation FE throughout this presentation. Financial exploitation is the unlawful or improper use of someone's funds or resources. It is a multi-billion dollar industry costing seniors $2.9 billion each year. However, only one in 44 incidents of financial abuse are reported to the authorities. Some key statistics to keep in mind. Nine out of 10 perpetrators are family members which is why very often they do not wish to report that abuse. An older adult who loses as little as $20 a year to exploitation is expected to lose an additional $2,000 a year to other types of fraud. One thing that I've seen in working with older adults to combat financial exploitation is often people will minimize their loss because they may be embarrassed, but also once they've been a victim of a scam or financial exploitation, they are being constantly pursued for money thereafter. Also answering just one telemarketing call per day is likely to result in three times as much financial loss. If somebody is home and isolated and answering the phone and engaging in conversations with scammers, they're much more likely to continue that type of behavior and answer those phone calls. So we're gonna break down the, the loss to seniors because there's different kinds of exploitation. There's traditional exploitation. That's when businesses, individuals, or charities use pressure tactics or misleading language to lead seniors into financial mistakes. That's when they're taking advantage of somebody's you know, time. Maybe they're, you know, they're being that used car salesman. They're really talking to somebody and trying to get them to maybe sign up for a product or service that they do not need or tugging on their heartstrings in order to get some money from them. Then there's fraud. That's when criminals actually commit identity theft or con seniors into sending money or sharing personal information. This could be through over the phone, asking for your financial information or your social security number and other information or by soliciting money, by building up a relationship or maybe a romantic relationship online. And lastly, there's trust abuse. And that's when family, friends, or paid caregivers take advantage in order to get money from the senior. Maybe they're just asking for money to help with their own bills, but you know, the ask will increase, the money will increase. So overall, it's a, the cost is staggering, $36.5 billion. Now we're gonna go over some conditions that increase risk. It's important to note that any senior is at risk for financial exploitation, but there are some conditions that can make some people more at risk than others. The first is a decreased physical health and mobility. As you decrease your physical health, decrease your ability to get around, you require more people to assist you and letting those people into your life in a very personal manner increases your risk that they might exploit you. The second is confusion, forgetfulness, or a decline in capacity. 
someone might not remember that they let their grandson have their debit card or that they signed up for a charity that they did not need. Capacity itself is a legal term that we will define in the next slide. The third is either social isolation or social butterfly. Being at either end of the spectrum can increase risk. Social isolation can increase risk because sometimes seniors get so lonely that they're just desperate for someone to talk to. Scammers will take advantage of this and fulfill that need for connection in order to exploit them for money. Social butterflies, on the other hand, love talking to anyone. They will talk and give all sorts of personal information because they just love having conversations. And that's, again, something that scammers will use to try and exploit seniors. An increased dependency on caregivers is also a condition that increased risk. Again, because it allows other people to be involved in a much more personal level in that senior's life in aspects of their life that they might not involve anyone else in before, such as their finances. And finally, poor family relationships, a history of mental health problems, drug abuse, gambling, will also increase risk of financial exploitation. Let's talk a little bit about capacity. Capacity is a cluster of mental skills, memory, logic, and other behavioral and physical functioning that individuals use in everyday life. It's a continuum of decision-making abilities. It's not binary. Someone may have the capacity to make the decision about what to have for breakfast that morning. They may not have the capacity to make the decision to sell their home or sign their deed over to someone else. It's rarely lost completely, except if someone is in a permanent vegetative state, they will have capacity to do at least some daily tasks, but capacity can change over time and over different situations and tasks performed. Like we said, someone can have capacity to do some things, but not capacity to do other things. And scammers will take advantage of the fact that seniors may not have capacity or may have limited capacity to make complex financial decisions, and that's where the scammer can come in and exploit them financially. So there are other effects of financial abuse, not just losing money. For seniors, it can cause a lot of depression and anxiety. They might be skipping their medical appointments or not buying groceries or not being able to eat because they are so worried about their financial health. In addition to losing their property or maybe other assets that are important to them. For caregivers, it, it can be hard. It can be hard to watch somebody lose their money or be the victim of one of these scams or financial abuse, it can cause, you know, some anxiety. It can, if you're caring for somebody and you're in a relationship and you've watched your spouse lose money, it can damage that relationship. It causes a lot of increased conflict with family and friends. When the perpetrator is another family member, it can lead to a lot of inner family breakdown. Also, career setbacks. If you're concerned and maybe having to take time and you know, take time off of work or do additional things to handle a huge financial loss, um, that may provide some career setbacks. So you lose more than just money. You lose your health, your emotional well-being, and your quality of life. Marriages are affected by this, people are skipping meals, and it causes people quite a bit of pain and anxiety. So if you're using this, what can you do? or if you're interested in any kind of screening tool, the senior financial safety tool, know your clients, know who's coming to you. You might have those frequent flyers or people who are consistently asking you for help. Know what maybe something seems amiss. Know how to ask those questions. Understand the banking habits of seniors. They're very, they may only receive social security or possibly a pension direct deposit. They're very regimented in their banking activities and most seniors are still on a budget or still maintain a savings account. Know that it's easy to detect unusual spending patterns or abnormal activity. We'll go through some of the warning signs and why the senior financial safety tool can be used. And also you can file a suspicious activity report if you're working in a financial institution. One important thing to note 
and this is information that was released in 2019, is that SAR filings on financial exploitation have quadrupled from 2013 until 2017. Just by the numbers over that same period of time, financial institutions reported a total of $1.7 billion in those activities in 2017 that's e either actual monies lost or attempts to steal funds. A third of those people who lost money were over the age of 80. Again, they may have had diminished capacity or they may be isolated, they may be widowed. Adults between 70 and 79 have the highest average monetary loss and a little over $45,000. Again, generationally speaking, this generation still may have savings they still have, may have equity in their home. They still may have access to retirement funds. Losses are always greater when the adult knew the suspect, and 7% of those losses involved a fiduciary relationship. So according to the CFPB, all these filings of SARS have been increasing, but that hasn't led to a corresponding increase of reports to law enforcement or adult protective services. We created the senior financial safety tool and the goal was to develop a detection and referral system so that we can work together collaboratively with our partners and community agencies to provide that quality person-centered services to older adults who are the victims of financial abuse. People have expressed concerns about completing that report. However, you know, there is protection over policy and the Graham Leach Biley compliance clarification said that financial institutions can disclose non-public personal information to law enforcement agencies investigating suspected financial abuse of older adults. That means that if a bank employee or if you suspect that somebody is abusing somebody financially, you can make that referral without retribution if you're providing non-public personal information in order to get that older adult assistance. Now we're gonna talk about some common warning signs that someone may be financially exploited. Before we talked about how you should know your clients or know your customers, these are some of the things you should be looking out for. With regard to financial transactions, you should be looking out for any activity that deviates from normal banking patterns. Most people have certain either paychecks, social security, or other benefits that are deposited at a certain time each month. And then they have certain expenses that they pay once those monies come in. If you are detecting all of a sudden large cash withdrawals that don't have any other explanation, if you're detecting wire transfers and someone who's never used a wire transfer service before, that can be a warning sign of financial exploitation. Also uncommon ATM or debit card use, um, especially with perpetrators who know their abuser, they may get their hands on an ATM or a debit card. So if you have a customer or a client who has never used an ATM in their life, and all of a sudden now you're seeing ATM transactions pop up, that can be a sign that something is amiss. Inactive accounts are suddenly being used or withdrawals are made for them. Some people may have money squirreled away in a rainy day fund that they don't normally use. If all of a sudden those inactive accounts are being used, that can be a sign that something's up. Um, suspicious signatures, handwriting in different pens. This can mean that someone, particularly a trusted person who is exploiting an adult, is trying to sign that adult signature to get access to their funds. Sudden non-sufficient funds or overdraft fees. If you have a client who has never overdrawn their account in their life and all of a sudden they're overdrawing every month, that's a serious red flag. And checks written out of sequence. If someone is stealing checks, they may not grab the top check off of the checkbook. They may grab the checks that are a few checks back so that it takes the senior longer to notice that some checks are missing. Another one is atypical electronic activity, uh, online banking, bill pay, wire transfers. As seniors become more technology inclined, they may start to use these things more often. But again, know your clients. If your client is someone who doesn't even own a computer, someone who has never expressed an interest in online banking, 
and all of a sudden they have an online banking account and all of their transactions are being made online, that's a sign that you should look into it a little bit further. There's suspicious activity regarding relationships, opening a joint account all of a sudden. If someone has never had a joint account, but is all of a sudden bringing someone in, particularly if it's someone who is not a spouse family member, but a different family member or a friend or someone who bills themselves as a caregiver, opening a joint account could be a sign that that person is being exploited. Another sign is a change of a power of attorney or a change in account beneficiaries for payable on death. These might be payable on death to their spouse and then all of a sudden someone changes it to be payable on death to a friend or a caregiver or someone else entirely. They may change their power of attorney. Sometimes seniors have valid reasons for doing this, but changes of this nature should be a sign that something might be amiss in their financial situation. Having mail redirected to a new address, this is another thing where you wanna know your client. If your client moved, of course their mail is gonna be redirected. If your client didn't move, but all of a sudden they're asking that their mail or their bank statements be directed to a different address, chances are that is a situation where it's not the client asking or the client is being forced to ask by someone who is trying to exploit them. <clears throat> a suspicious activity regarding relationships can also include a stranger that ac accompanies the customer to meetings or asserts rights to an individual's finances. If someone who is unfamiliar all of a sudden wants to always be in the room with your clients, they want to make all of the decisions, they're asking very imperious over your client, that can be a sign that your client is being exploited. And to go along with this includes new friends that suddenly appear interested in finances or relatives that you've never heard of before that aren't established caregivers who all of a sudden are very interested in this person's financial situation. Again, that could be a sign that they are new caregivers, but it's also something to look at because it could be a warning sign for exploitation. And again, a caregiver who speaks for a person in a silencing way a caregiver who's imperious over an older person. Caregivers who are legitimate are there to help the senior, not to take over their life. And so a caregiver who silences a senior and dismisses them and tries to make you feel like the senior's opinion is not important could be a caregiver that is exploiting the senior. There are some suspicious activities that involve changes in the customer themselves, um, opening inappropriate investments, in ch a change in the affect or physical or mental status. If you've got someone who you know who is usually in a good mood and all of a sudden they come in and they're consistently tired or they look consistently down, this could be a sign either they're at risk for exploitation or that they're being exploited right now. Um, customers that seem confused about finances. They may be seeing activity in their bank accounts that they don't understand. They may be seeing new credit card statements that come to their house for credit cards that they never opened. Confusion may also be a indicator of diminished capacity, which is a risk factor for financial exploitation. A person who is becoming increasingly isolated or dependent on a single friend, relative, or caregiver is a warning sign of exploitation because the people who are going to exploit an older person are gonna try and isolate them. It's similar to domestic violence where they want that person all to themselves because then it's that much easier to control that person and to control that person's finances. A person who seems nervous or afraid around a particular person, they might know that this person is exploiting them, but they might be afraid to do anything about it. This person may have been making threats against them to uh, take away their home or take away more of their money or take away their access to other family members. And so although your client is unlikely to tell you, I'm being abused by this person, they may give off these nonverbal signs by just seeming nervous or afraid around this particular person. And any change in physical appearance or hygiene, particularly if someone is depressed or anxious, 
hygiene and physical appearance are some of the first things to go. If someone looks like, you know, they haven't brushed their teeth in a while, they are wearing the same clothes over and over again that are not washed, they're not combing their hair or doing their makeup the way they normally do, this is where you need to know your clients because these changes can indicate that they are either being exploited or are at risk for exploitation. So when you're meeting with folks, one thing to keep in mind is how can we ask our clients the tough questions? People are very private about their financial affairs. So how can we ask them some of these harder questions? We can say, hey, this transaction seems a bit out of the ordinary for you. Do you mind if I ask you a few additional questions? Meaning you're not causing any flags, you're not causing any alarms. However, you're just kind of making sure that somebody, you know, you're slowing it down. You can always ask, how well do you know the person that you're sending money to? Do you know this individual that you're sending, that is, you're being asked to wire money to or send cash or money orders or some other form of transaction? Have you met them? You know, especially for banking customers, I see that someone else is bringing you into the bank. How do you know each other? You know, is this your granddaughter that you've talked about? Is this your neighbor that helps you run errands? You know, ask, who's this person that's now suddenly bringing you into the bank or maybe into the office? Can I ask you some more information about this transaction? I just want to kind of clarify what you need help with. Again, you're not, you don't want to alarm the customer. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. You just want to be conversational. You know, and really using a screening tool such as the senior financial safety tool can kind of guide that discussion. So what you'll need to watch out for are some of the top, this is um, from TrueLink Financial, but these are some of the top nine scams. I'm just gonna briefly touch on some that we see quite often um, in, at the Center for Elder Law and Justice. One is always the sweepstakes scams. You know, someone's won a prize and now you need to send in money to collect the winnings. It has various forms. You either need to pay money um, on taxes or, you know, you're gonna send this money so we can ship you the car. We need to pay the shipping costs, so please send us $5,000. I've said this now for almost a decade. If you win a prize, if you do win a prize, or if you do have something, you will never have to pay anything up front. You're gonna claim that income on your taxes, and because they, the, the government would, would like to you know, have a portion of that income, you do not need to pay for anything directly to them. Also, charitable donations. We see this quite a bit that, you know, there are charities out there that maybe mimic or have a name very similar to a different charity or, you know, with all these GoFundMe um, websites that are available right now, that they really take advantage of somebody's generosity and, you know, to request donations, either because they have memory loss and they're requesting repeatedly or they're pulling on someone's heartstrings and getting them to donate money for a cause that they may believe in, and then letting that, and, and it's fraudulent. The grandparent scam is still happening. Scammers are still calling late at night or in the middle of the night, um, pretending to be a family member. You know, usually it's a grandchild or someone in need of emergency funds by wire, by cash, uh, by money order. Again, you know, we encourage folks just to reach out to somebody else to confirm that that is the case. Um, the sweetheart scam, you know, with social media platforms such as Facebook and other dating sites really taking off, you know, these scammers are befriending lonely older adults to kind of get access to their money or be written into their wills. This is not a short-term scam. These people are really, you know, they're engaging in only email contact or contact by text, never in-person or phone contact, and they're spending a lot of time you know, talking to somebody, making them maybe feel good or feel like they have somebody out there they, they can speak with and slowly over time building up that love and that trust. And then the, the asks for money come, they may start small and they may increase in amount and severity. And there are other scams as well. You know, there's phishing scams, you know, people posing as government agencies, as financial institutions, 
as, you know, helpers or people need information about their health care. And they're asking for people's personal identification information, either over the phone, by email, and people are responding. You know, if somebody receives an email threatening that their social security benefits will be stopped, if they don't provide or verify their information, for somebody who's living paycheck to paycheck or is, you know, afraid of, you know, may have some food insecurity or other financial issues, they're more likely to provide that information. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about powers of attorney now, because although a power of attorney is a very helpful and useful tool for an older adult to have, it is also something that can be ripe for financial exploitation and scamming. The legal definition of a power of attorney is that it's a legal document in which an individual known as the principal gives authority to a third party known as the agent to perform certain tasks and conduct business on the principal's behalf. The power of attorney document lists the various tasks that the agent is authorized to undertake for the principal. This is a form of substituted decision-making document. There are other types of substituted decision-making documents as well, such as healthcare proxies, but today we're going to be talking about powers of attorney. In plain language, um, a power of attorney is where one person, typically an older adult, designates one or more agents they can appoint legally up to two agents as well as up to two successor agents. The agents are commonly referred to, referred to as the power of attorney or attorney in fact, and then the agents act on the authority that the power of attorney document grants to the agent. What the agents can and can't do is spelled out in the document in very specific terms. The agents have a fiduciary duty once they sign the power of attorney agreement to act in the principal's best interest. They always must make decisions with the document that make the principal's lives better. They can act anytime after the document is executed, even if the principal still has full capacity. Older adults might have a power of attorney if they are physically limited and need to send their son or their grandchild to the bank to them every two weeks to get some money out of the ATM or get some money from a bank teller. They have the capacity to make those decisions and decide that they need money themselves. They just might not have the physical ability to do it or it might be difficult for them to get around. But importantly, the agents do not need to wait for a principal to lose capacity before they act. They can act at any point after the document is executed. There are some tips that we can give you as to when to honor a power of attorney. The law provides that a financial institution can reasonably refuse to honor a written power of attorney document under the following circumstances. And these are spelled out in New York State's general obligations law. If the agent refuses to provide an original copy of the power of attorney, if the bank knows or reasonably believes that, that the agent may be abusing the principal, or that the power of attorney was obtained by fraud, duress, or undue influence. And this is back where you get to the point where you know your customers and those warning signs that we talked about. If you see those warning signs with regard to a particular agent, you may reasonably believe that the agent is abusing the principal. Or if the bank knows that the power of attorney has been revoked. When a power of attorney is revoked, generally a revocation document will be provided to banks and financial institutions. If a bank knows that the POA has been revoked, then the bank may refuse to honor that POA if an agent comes in and tries to use a revoked power of attorney. So what can you do? What can you do if you suspect abuse? One, you can always take the time to verify that there is an authority to conduct the transaction. Again, ask to see that power of attorney inquire about the relationship to the customer. And if you do have a power of attorney, verify the agent's identity. If somebody is in trying to conduct business on behalf of, of the principal, ask to verify the power of attorney and ask to view their ID. If somebody comes in and they're expressing concerns about financial exploitation, try to isolate the customer. 
try to speak with them alone, ask questions about the transactions when it is safe to do so. Pay attention how your, to how your customer reacts. Maybe they may be scared, they may be looking over their shoulder, they may be fearful, just pay attention. If you're able to kind of, you know, slow the transaction down and walk them over to another area and kind of have a private conversation, you may be able to make sure that they are more comfortable before proceeding. There is nothing wrong with saying, you know, I have some concerns about this transaction. When is a good time for me to call you, especially if somebody's waiting for them or they're in a hurry to get out of there or they don't want to have that conversation, maybe in front of other customers that are in the bank. Take the time to follow up. Delane inform. Inform a manager and follow your chain of command if you do suspect abuse. You can always ask the customer if you can conduct a quick screen with the cleaning your financial safety tool. If anyone is coming to your window or your desk and they're expressing concerns about their statements, their power of attorney, whether or not they've given up their financial in information, if they're a victim of identity theft, take them through the tool, two to three minutes, and please let them know that there is assistance available to them. And as we always say here in our office, if you see something, say something. One thing to can always consider is that there may be some communication problems, you know, when you're speaking with older adults and how to kind of overcome those obstacles. Understand that people may be confused over your terminology or the technology. Not everybody has access to a computer or a smartphone. So they may not understand, you know, if you're trying to review things with them or ask them about their online activity. Often people who are the victims of abuse, especially financial abuse, it will elicit a strong emotional response. It can come out as fear. It can come out as anger. And sometimes your customers may have difficulty hearing or seeing what you're saying. So to take that time to follow up, to make sure that you can have a, a conversation that is appropriate, that is secure, that makes them comfortable is important. Don't assume that just because you're showing them documents or something they may have signed, that they even have the ability to read or see that document. Always you use clear and concise language. Ask open-ended questions. See if they're able to, you know, respond to you and give you a little bit of history about that transaction. Again, be a good listener, especially victims who of scams, they often fall prey to these scammers because they want someone to listen to them. They want someone to talk to. Take the time to really kind of listen to your older customers and, and listen to what they have to say. Treat them with respect and allow them time to respond. They may not be as quick to look up something or be able to review a document or scan something like you can as a financial professional. Allow them time to process and respond and always offer to follow up um, through the senior financial safety tool. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about working with adult protective services or protective services for adults. These are two names for the same type of organization that exists in every county in New York State. New York unfortunately does not require mandatory reporting in cases of elder abuse, with the exception that certain facilities and Protective services for adults or adult protective services are mandated reporters. However, any individual that becomes concerned about an elderly or impaired adult can call their local PSA APS office. For those who do call, the social services law provides immunity from civil liability to any person who in good faith refers an adult that they believe may need protective services. This means you don't have to worry about getting sued if you refer a customer for protective services and it turns out they don't need it, or it turns out maybe they did need it, but they didn't want it. You are immune from liability under social services law. So it's very important that if you see something, you say something. And one of the agencies you can talk to about financial exploitation when you suspect it in a particular older adult is your local adult protective services or protective services for adults office. And finally, you can always contact the Center for Elder Law and Justice. We are available to answer any questions you may have. We have close working relationships with departments of the aging, uh, APS or PSA departments, and other agencies that assist older adults. 
We also have relationships with enhanced multidisciplinary teams across Western New York. These are teams of professionals from various aspects of life, law enforcement, banking, social workers, and legal that work on elder abuse cases so that it can kind of be a one-stop shop for addressing an elder abuse case, resolving it, and preventing it from continuing. And finally, the senior financial safety tool that was developed with the Center for Elder Law and Justice, it was created specifically to provide you with a mechanism to make referrals to CellJ. You can make a referral at the customer's um, permission for any time you feel that financial exploitation may be happening, and we can take it from there. We have experts with financial exploitation that can assist the senior with any level of assistance they might need. Maybe they just need a new power of attorney, or maybe they just need a safety plan. Maybe they're interested in litigation against the person who's exploiting them. Whatever they need to assist them with making sure the exploitation stops and making sure it doesn't happen again, we can help you with. We wanna thank you for having this training with us today. And then we wanna just remind you that anytime you have questions, you can contact the Center for Elder Law and Justice. Again, my name is Erin Riker and I'm our technology-based legal services attorney. And this training was also joined by Melissa Woods, who is the project coordinator for the Senior Financial Safety Tool. Our phone number at the Center for Elder Law and Justice is 716-853-3087. And you can feel free to call us with any questions you may have, or if you'd like additional training on the Senior Financial Safety Tool to become a partner with us on that initiative.